This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. And with me today is John Vandermosen. He is the senior biotech analyst at Zax SCR. John, welcome. It's good to see you. Hey, thank you, Bobby. Good to be here. Great to have you on as always. And uh, for those who may have missed our, our first interview that we did together back in, in Austin, you know, let, let's start off with your background. You know, how did you get to being the senior biotech analyst at Zax SCR? It's, it's been a long and winding road, Bobby, but uh, it actually started in Austin, Texas, where we first spoke. Uh, I was an analyst and portfolio manager at the Teacher Retirement System of Texas and uh, worked on a bunch of large cap stocks. We actually wrote calls, uh, short call options on uh, constituents of the S&P 500 index. And uh, I did that for about four and a half years until I came up here to Dallas to work with a firm called Westwood Holdings Group. And uh, I did a bunch of things there. I was a, also a portfolio manager and, and analyst and uh, covered a variety of things. Uh, started out in energy, uh, moved on to uh, consumer, uh, also covered a bit of telecom and cable, and then uh, finally moved on to healthcare, where I covered the services and, and pretty broadly the whole space. Uh, did that for about seven years um, and then thought I'd try something new. And I was a valuation consultant for a firm in Atlanta for, for about three years. That was fun and exciting, but when I was there, I kind of missed uh, the the uh, the um, you know working with stocks and, and the markets and all of that thing since it was mostly private companies, and decided to come back as a sell side analyst and, and cover biotech and and I've been there for about the last um, since what where was it uh, 20, 2016. so it's been you know going on four years now, mm -hmm. so it's pretty exciting. So so what would you say is the initial thing that drew you to wanting to really be in biotech and analyze biotech stocks and healthcare. I mean, what was it? You know, I, it started when I was young, strangely enough, even though I never got a degree in a, a science. Uh, it's always been in uh, other things, history, literature, uh, business, things like that. Uh, I always had a, a strong desire to, to learn about science. And uh, when the chance came to do that as an analyst, I, I hopped right onto it. Um, you know, that's the thing that actually keeps me most excited about looking for new companies is what's the new science out there? What what are people working on uh, that's cutting edge? And even even companies that are working on things that have been around for a while, they're looking at it new in different ways. I think that's interesting. And understanding how it works. I mean, there's this thing that we talk about a lot in biotech called the mechanism of action. That's probably my favorite part is figuring out how a drug works, how it gets into the human body and makes and you know makes us make ourselves better in the case of immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what's interesting, and you know because this comes up a lot on my podcast is you know a, a lot of uh, the investors who I who I interview some tend to stay away from biotech and healthcare because they're like, listen, I don't I don't have a PhD, I'm not an MD, it's difficult, I, you know, outside of my you know, core competency. I mean, you're kind of proof that, you know, look, you don't need an MD or PhD to <laughs> be an analyst in this space. It Well, I will say it does take a lot of time and focus. It helps, to, I'm sure. To understand, <laughs> understand that, you know, I, you know, I, I can, I can kind of relate to other, other spaces because I cover the consumer. I think it's not as hard to be a consumer analyst as it is to be a biotech analyst. Sure. If you're a consumer analyst, you can go visit the stores and you know you intuitively know how things are kind of going and, and understand it because we're all consumers, right? But for biotech, uh, it does take it does take a lot of investment and time, and that's you know that's one of the things I try to do as an analyst. And I think coming from a different perspective, you know, I'm not an MD, I, I'm not a PhD, and in, 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 in um, you know, biology or chemistry or biochemistry, um, I can kind of take the complex topics and concepts and translate them into a language that can help a greater, you know, a larger uh, group understand what's going on there. So, you know, I, I see that as my role. Um, when I was reading research from other analysts, when I was on the buy side, I always felt like the biotech research was a little, a little bit over my head. So, I kind of took that in mind when I'm when I'm performing that role and try to, you know, translate it down to where uh, somebody with you know a good amount of scientific understanding can get to it, um, but also make sure that you know I, I put it in language plain enough so that uh, you can understand really what's going on. Mm -hmm. So to transition here, you know, I, I the main reason I I wanted to have you on today 
is because, you know, as we said, you are the senior biotech analyst at Zax SCR. And, and I really wanted to do a recap of 2019 and, and kind of looking ahead at 2020. But really, before we get into that, I, I want our audience to learn a little bit more about your investing philosophy when you're sure. assessing a potential new healthcare or biotech investment. You know, so what are some of that criteria that you look for? Yeah, there's a there's a number of things that we look for. One one of the guiding rules that we use is the probability of success. There's a there's a high failure rate in biotech. I mean, that's probably another reason why many people don't want to play in it because uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the drugs that that go through the process do not end up making it. But for the ones that do, the payoff can be significant. Uh, you know, we hear about the multi-billion-dollar drugs uh, that that are out there, and you know that's that's the success story, right? So. What we try to do is apply probability to our analysis. And there, there's a lot of research out there that's been done uh, on, on products that are in development and what the likelihood is of them moving through the process and eventually being approved by the FDA. So that's, that's really important. And we break it down in a number of ways. Uh, you know, what stage of development are you in? There's, there's phase one, two, and three uh, clinical trials. You know, as you move along from one stage to the next, the probability that you succeed increases, right? So that's one thing that, that intuitively makes sense. Uh, there are also certain indications which um, are more likely to succeed in the, than others. Vaccines, now that is an area where many, many of them uh, are approved. Uh, we get our flu vaccine every year, that has a high rate of success. Others, uh, in the early 2000s, oncology, we saw a very low rate of success. So we, we put all those things together uh, along with our estimate of market size, what the drug, what price might be charged for the drug, and a whole host of other factors that take into, com uh, take into account of comp uh, competition. And uh, we put together a, a model, a financial model that, uh, that determines a price. And, and when, the, when, the, when the target price that we determine is higher than what the market price is, um, we tend to like it. So, you know, I just did an interview the other day when I was talking to another microcap investor and, and, I, and I asked most of my microcap investors the same thing. It, and this really applies small micro nano, it's, you know, it, to paint it more with a broad stroke is, uh, you know, what, what's the hair that's tolerable for you? So in biotechs, mm. and I, do, do, I hope you know what I mean by that. But I'm, sure, I'm sure, sure. I'm sure. But, so for you, what, what would you say is some of the hair that you, you tolerate? You know, that it, you're like, okay, I'll move to the next stage in my analysis of this company. You know, right. at first glance, you're looking at it like, I don't know, but now you're like, all right, okay, I, it, all, all these other things are might be valuable. Let, let's move forward then. Yeah, we'll, we'll take something with a little bit of hair on it. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think you have to, one, one thing that I think you want to avoid in terms of hair is regulatory issues and safety issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes if there's an efficacy question, uh, that may be solved a little bit later on. But if there's, if, you know, if there's been a death or something, I think on a trial, or you know, there's been severe uh, adverse events or adverse reactions to the drug, sometimes that, that hair is a little bit more difficult to, to uh, comb, I think, than uh, if, if the drug maybe doesn't work in a certain segment and you just need to figure out why. Because if, if the drug works in a certain population, you may be able to adjust the trial a little bit later mm -hmm. to focus on that population where it works. So I think to answer your question, um, I'd, I'd frame it that way. Gotcha. So my next question will probably ultimately segue into our recap of 2019. But I have to ask too, you know, it seems like technology, especially in biotech, medtech, moves so fast where, you know, we could sure. do this, we could do this recap interview on a monthly basis almost <laughs> be, just to try and keep up with just all the advancements that are coming through with, with all the new technology, with telemedicine and, you know, advancements in vaccines, all, all that kind of stuff. So for you as an analyst, I mean, at what point you're like, okay, we just want to start with proving out this works first. And then we can ex assess the viability of some of these new technologies that might be implemented for biotech and healthcare solutions. I mean, how do you balance that out? Yeah, you know, I mean, here's the thing. It takes 10 to 15 years to get a drug from the lab to the FDA where they, you know, finally say yes or no. Right. And a lot of things can change in that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you just look at drugs like Keytruda or Opdivo. Those are the checkpoint inhibitors that have made, you know, tremendous uh, bounds in, in, uh, immuno oncology. Uh, you know, the first, uh, the first drug in that class came out, I think in 2012 
And now there's multiple, I think over 60 indications where, you know, we're using checkpoint inhibitors and there's a lot of other ones coming on the way. You know, if you had started a, a you know, a cancer uh, program, uh, not in that space, you know, not in uh, immuno oncology, uh, the environment, you know, if you'd started that back in like, so let's say 2011, you know, by the time you've gotten to today, which is, you know, eight, eight years later, uh, the environment has changed so radically that, you know, your drug might not even be relevant anymore. So I think you always have to pay attention to the changing environment. And I've seen companies, they will, they will abandon a program when, uh, when, you know, there, another competitor comes along that seems to treat it better than what their drug might. Mm-hmm. So my, my other follow up then to what you're saying, cause you're right. I mean, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's 10, 15 year pri- uh, uh, time frame usually. So then my follow up to that would be is, you know, there's most of our audience maybe is out there like, okay, 10 to 15 years. I, I don't know, you know, if it gets bought out, who, know, who knows what could happen. Right. But, right. But what, what are some of the things in biotech and healthcare med tech that investors maybe who don't have that same kind of time frame to wait can look at as to and see, okay, this might sure. be coming coming onto the market a little bit sooner. How yeah. do they get onto the market a little bit sooner? Yeah, I think I, I think I know what you're asking. Uh, and let me answer it in a little different way. I mean, there's certain points that you want to hit, certain kind of value inflection points that are out there. Uh, there's one value inflection point when you start to go into the clinic and you'd have your first in-man testing of the right. product, right? And and then there's another inflection point when you finish phase two, and that's known as proof of concept. And that means your drug now is kind of shown it can work, and you're ready to really prove it to the FDA. And a lot of times, companies will get bought out after they finish their phase two studies. Uh, so that's another inflection point. And the, and the time period between starting a phase one and completing a phase two, that could be a much shorter time, two and a half to three years maybe, mm-hmm. right? And if, if that's the strategy that you want to use, uh, you know, to sell uh, after good phase two data, that's, you know, that's a great strategy. And a lot of, a lot of investors do that. Um, others will say, Hey, I'm not going to get into something until phase three. Uh, you know, we started that and there's a good value indication there. Uh, and you know, once you're in phase three, you know, you could be from, you know, two, two to three years away, you know, that's not that long, right. uh, from, from having something, the, the environment is a lot more clear in terms of, you know, what the competitive environment will be. Uh, so, you know, there's distinct and discrete segments of time in, in the advancement process where I think, you know, certain investors, investors could, uh, could place themselves. And, you know, for, for individuals who don't want to uh, take the risk, they can buy the large biotechs who look for the great ideas. And when they emerge, the large biotechs buy them. They, they complete uh, the commercialization process and start generating revenue. So, um, you know, they may pay a lot. You know, you may not see a 10 to 1 payoff. Um, but you know, you will be able to participate in biotech and, and participate in that area, which, you know, corresponds to your risk profile. Right. Okay. So now we're getting to that recap. Let's All right. hear, what, what would you say are, are, are some of the most interesting news stories of 2019 for the healthcare industry? Sure. Sure. Well, I was trying to, you know, we were talking about this about a week ago and I was trying to think, you know, what happened over the last year? Cause sometimes something happened and it seems like it was years ago rather than just a few months ago. But if you recall at the beginning of the year that we had a government shutdown going on and at least in my space, uh, there was concern that, uh, that drugs that were trying to initially get into the clinic and, and drugs that were trying to advance from phase one to two or three couldn't do so because the FDA wouldn't be able to, um, to get involved there. Uh, it turned out that that was a non-event, at least for, for most of the guys that I cover. I think there may have been a few delays. Uh, but that's how we started out the year. Uh, we also had uh, drug pricing was a big issue. Uh, this was another event which seems like it happened a lot longer ago. But I think it was in February when there were the executives. I think there were seven pharma executives in front of Congress uh, justifying why their prices were so high and why in- their inflation and in their drug was so much higher than you know what we see in the economy overall. Um, you know that kind of that kind of petered out. We really didn't get much on uh, uh, on drug pricing uh, efforts. I'm trying to think what else. Um, the biggest news for the year, uh, I think, was aducanumab. Um, uh, are you familiar with Biogen and aducanumab? Of course. Yeah, yeah. It was all over the news back in March. I was actually walking down to walking down the street on a cold March morning, and uh, I got a call from somebody saying, "Hey, did you hear about Biogen?" <laughs> and I had no idea they were supposed to come out with their trial results in 2020, right? But it was March, and they reported that uh, aducanumab would. Uh, supposedly not reach its primary endpoint 
and uh, they were just going to abandon it. So that was a huge shock, a huge shock, because that was seen as the best and brightest hope for Alzheimer's. And, you know, for our viewers and listeners, Alzheimer's is the sixth most deadly disease in the United States, but it's the only one in the top 10 that doesn't have any kind of treatment uh, that can address it. So, um, you know, this was a big punch in the gut for the whole uh, amyloid beta space, which is the, the target that aducanumab was going after. And uh, we saw investment dry up and there was all this concern that, you know, where do we go next in Alzheimer's? Uh, however, seven months later, in uh, I think it was October, late October, uh, there was a complete reversal. And Biogen came out and said, hey, you know, we made a mistake. We looked at some data that came out a little bit later and it looks like aducanumab works. So uh, it's really surprising. The FDA does not look favorably upon uh, reversals like that in clinical trials. We're not supposed to have surprises, you know, it's supposed to go as expected and then uh, have a statistically significant result at the end. However, that's not what happened. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's probably the biggest story of the year mm -hmm. uh, in aducanumab, the reversal. So, you know, I'm, I'm consulting some of our notes because we, you know, there, there's a, it's a long year, you know, a lot, a lot it has happens. been, you know, so you mentioned also in, in your notes about, um, uh, in February, or, or you talking about that, but, um, uh, talking about M&A and that yeah. there, was, there was a lot of M&A this year. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's been a bunch of deals. It started out, it started out pretty big. Uh, that was the the Bristol Myers cell gene announcement. I think that was in the first week of uh, of January. Seventy four billion dollar deal. Uh, it just got closed recently. Uh, it took you know quite a while to do that. Uh, the focus there was oncology, but there was a number of other areas as well. Uh, another big deal, also I think in the first week, was the um, uh, the Loxo oncology that was bought by Lilly. That was an eight billion dollar deal. Mm -hmm. uh, another oncology deal. Um, so, you know, it started out pretty big and then there was a, in gene therapy, there was the Roche and spark therapeutics deal. That was a multi-billion dollar deal as well. So I think they kind of set the tone for the areas that would get the most attention over the year. Um, uh, you know, gene therapy and, uh, and oncology. And just in December, there have been a number of deals as well. Uh, I'm trying to recall them right now. Look, taking a look at my notes, but, uh, there were, there were two oncology deals and uh, one gene therapy deal in the first week of um, in the first week of December, and those those were uh, Arcule, uh, Audentes, and uh, Synthorx that were acquired by uh, Merck, Astellas, and and Sanofi, uh, respectively. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's been you know it's been a hot year for for oncology and gene therapy drugs. So we'll see if that'll continue to next year. I was going to say, wasn't Art because you know, look, this is a microcap podcast. That's our that's our focus here. Um, was Arcule was a was a microcap? No, it. Uh, I can't remember the market cap uh, when they when they were bid for, but a two point seven dollar two point seven billion dollar deal. So um, you know, probably the small micro. Yeah, it probably was. That, that if, if it, if it, I think it doubled. I think it was a doubling. So that would make it uh, you know just about a little over one and a half. Yeah, I think, about one and a half. I think GNMX was too, as well, a Avi Genomic. I'm just, I think. Yeah, right, sure. right. Yeah, that was a little bit smaller deal, right? right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, the thing, the main point of me bring, bringing this up is I just want to, you know, let our audience know is that, you know, look, this m a strategy that, that seems to be a strategy that most small micro nano cap biotech sure. companies tend to take. Because as we've said now, at nausea, it's 10 to 15 years to take a drug you know, from the clinic to, to there. And especially big pharma is looking for them personally. It's actually cheaper to go and buy those smaller companies that are doing all the work. And if it works, oh, it's just easier to just snatch them up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's where the best R&D takes place uh, is in the smaller companies. You know, when you look at a large company, I don't think they have the incentive structure that you do at a small company. At a small sure. company, you either do or die. Right. You know, you, you're either going to be rich or bankrupt. <laughs> so you got to you got to really uh, pull out all the stops to, you know, make it work, make it work. And, you know, I will say you had to, your previous question was uh, regarding, you know, what what's our approach to looking at stocks? And I think a good exit strategy, you know, understanding what your exit strategy is, is a good mm -hmm. is a good way to do it. I mean, there's several ways that a company can do that. Either they can develop a drug themselves or they can look for a partner and, and have the partner taken on. And I, I think for many small companies looking for a partner, 
you know, that does have a, a commercialization infrastructure in place is the way to go. Well, another business strategy that I've seen recently, and in, 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 I mean, it's nothing new, but I, I've just seen it relatively recently in some of the interviews I've done with the CEOs, is um, you see a lot of companies that maybe have another asset that's, ca- that's generating cash flow, and they'll use that to fund some of their clinical trials and and precisely that, yeah and that kind of takes them to the next level i mean what do you what do you think about when you see companies yeah like i have one company and i should i should i mention one of our companies that's using a similar strategy as long as you disclose sure we, we it's one of the ones we cover it's called promise neurosciences ticker symbol pmn uh we do cover that and i do not own it uh but they have a portfolio of neurodegenerative diseases uh they have an alzheimer's uh drug which is the most advanced it's still in preclinical but they've shown a lot of promise there, ha <laughs> promise, promise neurosciences. But uh, they've shown a lot of promise with that drug. But the interest has not been so much with an Alzheimer's drug because of what I previously mentioned about aducanumab. Mm-hmm. So they have another uh, set, another uh, set of drugs that are uh, focused on um, uh, um, Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, and a few others. That where there has been interest from others. So their strategy is actually to partner one of these other drugs, you know, where there's interest out there in the market, get some upfront cash mm-hmm. and uh, use that upfront cash as you to develop their Alzheimer's disease drug in house. And that's great for shareholders because they retain full ownership of that most valuable asset. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great strategy to use if you have a portfolio of, of drugs that you can, um, you know, keep some and, and share some. What, what about when you see these companies that, you know, tend to get a lot of grants and, you know, don't have mm. to go out and do secondaries all the time to continue to fund sure. operations? I mean, is that stuff that's also interesting to you that when, when you see it out yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the grants are for preclinical work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that will really help a company get to the stage where they can file an investigational new drug application. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are extremely important. I mean, there's so much great science being done with, with government grants. Uh, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why United States and Boston and uh, and San Francisco are, you know, some of the best hubs for creating new new products in the industry. Mm-hmm. So those are extremely important. But I think once you get into the clinic, uh, the grants fade a little bit and you need to have public shareholder support. And I think, you know, it's really important. I, I said earlier that looking and trying to estimate the probability of success is really difficult. Right. Before you get into the clinic, it's even more difficult. At least when you get into the clinic, there's data out there um, because every time you you do a clinical trial, you need to file uh, with with the government. Uh, right. You need to make you know you need to make a report with them that you've had it. So we can actually pull out the data and determine you know the success rate out there. So I think that makes it a lot easier for investors to get involved after we're in the clinic. Um, and we're in phase one, two, three trials. Mm-hmm. But before that, as you said, the grants are extremely important. Uh, National Institute of Health grants, uh, they're ubiquitous out there for getting things started and to the stage where they can go in uh, into in-man trials. Right. Okay. So we've talked a lot about the good and exciting stuff that's uh, happened this year. And there's more actually that, that we'll talk about. But, you know, there's also some uh, negative headlines affecting the space, you know, sure. um, it, Talk about some of the. Can you talk about some of the lawsuits and and you address drug pricing a little bit earlier as well? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the biggest the biggest deal this year out there in terms of like negative news was uh, Purdue Pharma, Insys mm-hmm. uh, Pharma as well, and and probably everyone is familiar with the opioid crisis which has been going on. I think it's kind of pulled back in terms of being at top of mind in the news in the last in the last uh, couple quarters. Uh, last year, it was really big. I mean, it's a really big problem. It's it's probably not been solved. Um, but Purdue Pharma uh, was uh, a lot of state attorneys general um, filed suit against the the um, the company uh, against not only Purdue, but also Insys for uh, making the uh, opium opium based drugs too uh, too available. So um, both of those companies went bankrupt. And, uh, you know, Purdue is actually going to continue to operate. Um, I believe, but they're gonna they're going to uh, use all of the, the funds to go to the states that that sued them for uh, for what they did. So yeah, that was probably the big uh, the big negative out there. There are a bunch of other bankruptcies. I saw a list of uh, eleven biotech bankruptcies, including those two names out there. Uh, I think it's a little bit higher than it has been in the past, uh, but uh, you know that happens. I mean, it's good to clear out the bad stuff so that capital can be freed up to focus on what's working. Right. 
So now my, my question to you now is, you know, in terms of, let's say the, the trends in biotech and healthcare, you know, what have been some of the more interesting spaces to you? You know, you mentioned in your notes something about oncology, <clears throat> neurodegenerative diseases. We talked about that already a little bit, sure. but can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think both of those are interesting areas. Um, you know, gene therapy is another one, mm -hmm. which I think is quite interesting. I mean, we've had a bunch of approvals in that area. Uh, there was one even just a few months ago in um, in uh, in Europe, uh, advancing that. Uh, so that's you know that's another area. I'm trying to think what else, but you know the deals that have been taken place have been in those in those areas in yeah. gene therapy and in immuno oncology. Um, one of the trends, another one of the trends that we've seen in immuno oncology is uh, the push for combination therapies. Uh, that's where you take two or more drugs and use them together. And we've we've realized that cancer isn't a singular singular disease. It's actually there's many components to it. Tumors are they have many different types of cells in the tumor, and some of them respond to some therapies and some to others. And that's why when you see an individual go into remission. It's called remission because it might come back, and part of that tumor that wasn't killed, or you know, part of those uh, mutated tumors may not respond to the drug, and they'll come back and they'll expand and metastasize. So that's why you've seen so many um, drugs that focus on specific mutations also uh, be part of these deals that have been going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, why is that? Why why is why is oncology, neurodegenerative diseases? gene therapy, why, why these sectors are, are, have kind of taken center stage this year in 2019? Yeah, I, I, I think because they're making breakthroughs. <clears throat> you, I know, I, you know, when it, the hardest thing to do is to get the FDA to uh, approve a drug in a certain class. Once it, gets in, once it gets past the FDA, the FDA has a group of people who understand it now. That makes it so much easier for the second company to come through and explain you know, what they did and justify why their drug is safe and effective. Uh, and to get it through. So, you know, we saw that with immuno oncology, you know, about six, seven years ago, um, you know, with Keytruda, Optiva, which I mentioned before. And, and now with gene therapy, we've seen a few come through. Another area is CAR-T, uh, that's uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell, which actually m it helps your immune system uh, focus and identify very specific markers on cancer cells. Uh, you know, these are all you know, really innovative types of approaches. And, you know, once the FDA and others understand them, it makes it a lot easier for the next one to come along. And, you know, another point I think I should make is in uh, in the checkpoint inhibitor space. And again, that's that's Optivo, Keytruda are probably the best known names. Tocentric is another one. They are getting approved in more and more indications and actually um, they're moving up to first line and first line therapy means that's the one you get first. when you're first diagnosed, you get first line therapy checkpoints. When they first came out, they were actually second line therapy or third line therapy after, uh, you know, after surgery, chemotherapy and, uh, radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. But now they've, they've started to move up as people learn how they work better. They're moving up to first line, which is really important. We're also seeing a lot of kind of second tier, um, therapies come through in the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. And that's great because that'll help bring the price down. You know, right now the price for checkpoints is, you know, f between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars for a course of treatment, you know, which is really, really expensive. It's really pressuring the system. But I think as we get more options out there, we're going to get better, better checkpoints. And we're also going to see the price come down. So it'll be a lot more affordable for uh, the system. I see. And you also mentioned in your notes in here, uh, regarding uh, distribution and connected world. Can you expand on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, you know, cost has been an issue forever, sure. right? And inflation in healthcare has been higher than overall inflation forever also. I, I don't know what it was in the last year, but two years ago, uh, healthcare made up 18% of the GDP, right? It must be higher now. I haven't seen a, an updated number, but I know that healthcare inflation has been higher, so it could be up to 20% right now. But I mean, you know, we got to have some kind of pushback on that. And we're starting to see it. You know, one of the things uh, that's affected that is that we have these high deductible healthcare plans right now, which means that consumers are paying more and more and more. It's coming out of their pocket. When they see a drug, they're prescribed a drug, they're thinking, I got to think about how much this costs, you know, not, mm -hmm. not just, is it going to work or is, you know, uh, they need to think about cost and effectiveness, uh, more than they did in the past. So what companies 
are going to have to do in the future is recognize that there's price sensitivity or elasticity in drug prices now that they're, that we didn't really think about before. So one of my companies, um, it's called Vivas Health. They and we do cover them. They are working on. Uh, they have a they have a weight loss drug, and they're trying to change the way it's distributed to people who can really benefit from it. Mm-hmm. And the way they did it before is they used normal distributors, which were very expensive. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they also charged what they thought the market would bear. They didn't really do any pricing uh, elasticity studies. Well, the new management at Vivas actually decided to see what would be the best balance between price and volume. Mm-hmm. And they also took out some of the middlemen, some of the distributors, and went direct to consumer from an online pharmacy. And they reduced the price from about $200 to about $100, and they saw uh, a 50 to 100% increase in the amount of uh, people who are willing to take the drug, because for this type of drug, it's actually out-of-pocket payment, Mm -hmm. right? So they've been very innovative in the way they're looking at uh, the way drug pricing should be, and they've been very innovative um, in in technology as well. Uh, A couple other things that they're working on are um, using iPhones and, and Apple Watches, to monitor health, especially for weight loss patients. That's very important. <clears throat> uh, they also have <clears throat> internet linked scales so they can monitor on a daily basis uh, where um, you know where the weight is, how effective is the drug being. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, they're working on telemedicine, which is which will allow a patient to consult with a physician more frequently um, and also get prescribed this drug. Uh, you know, from home and in telemedicine in so many cases is so much more efficient than some of the other practices uh, of, you know, driving to the doctor, finding a parking space or taking the bus, depending on your situation, you know, you can just do it from home. So they've come up with a lot of answers to difficulties out there that I think really can, can help improve the sales of their product. Gotcha. All right. So before I get to my next question, um, just want to get the full disclosures out there. You know, you mentioned uh, Vivas and also Promise as yep. uh, being companies that are covered by Zach's SCR. Um, you mentioned a, quite a few other names, so just want to uh, give you a chance to uh, disclose uh, ownership and whatnot. Sure. Uh, I own none of the names that we've discussed today, and mm-hmm. we're, we're actually prohibited from owning names that we uh, cover at, at Zach's. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we cover, as you said, Promise Neurosciences and Vivas uh, as, as clients of Zach's. Perfect. Okay, so... Now, you talked about elasticity in drug pricing and how that's really going to be more of a changing environment. And this leads to my next question is, you know, we have big election coming up in 2020. Mm. Um, You know, even the current White House has mentioned wanting to reduce uh, drug prices. And and then also on the Democrat side, you know, you have many of the leading candidates talking about health care for all. You know, so I wanted to get your opinion. You know, let's say you know, the White House does flip, you know, uh, to Democrats. And let's say some of these initiatives do move forward. You know, how would this affect the healthcare industry? You know, what are the mechanics of these things even coming into existence? Yeah, I think, you know, when you hear about single payer healthcare, that would mostly affect managed care and the hospitals and a lot of the services side of things. Um, The drug pricing part, that that will affect more my area in the biotechnology space, Mm -hmm. uh, the pharma space. you know, I, I, there was just a proposal I, I heard, I think, yesterday or in the last few days where the, the uh, Trump administration is going to allow uh, imports from Canada. I, I just think that's the silliest thing in the world, to be honest with you. I mean, we're, you know, the United States government is going to rely on, on a, a country that's 10 percent the size of us to determine our, our drug policy and make drugs affordable. Uh, uh, so I don't think that's going to affect anything. And that's probably why they did it, because it's not going to affect anything. <clears throat> However, I, I believe that because of this elasticity of drugs that has really come front and center in the last several years, I think that if the government doesn't do anything, that the market is going to do something. Because, you know, when you have a rare disease and you charge hundreds of thousands of dollars for a cure, that's fine if there's only, you know, one out of 10,000 people who has the disease. But when you start doing that for all diseases, the, the, you know, the cost needs to be spread over everybody who has insurance, right? So it's just, it's come to a point where it's really not affordable anymore. And I think companies that are going to be able to innovate around that price issue are the ones that are going to succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had many conversations with executives how drugs uh, take too long to get approved. Uh, they cost too much to go through the clinical trial process. And the success rate is too low. And we need to work on these three things 
uh, to solve the problem rather than, you know, having the government get in there and probably not really do anything that's going to solve anything. Um, so, you know, those are, those are some of the issues that are out there. Uh, you know, will we see any efforts on, on those side of things? I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of concern next year when we get into the general election, uh, everybody's going to promise everything and, you know, we'll probably see a sell off. Um, you know, we saw the same thing in 2008 and nine, you know, in the healthcare space, when, uh, you know, when, when, when the election was taking place uh, back then, that, you know, there would be a single payer health care and the, and the uh, managed care guys would, you know, go away. It never happened. Uh, I think it'll be difficult to change the, the environment like that. So I don't think that's a big possibility. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Um, I do think that companies that are going to be able to innovate, I think companies that are recognized those three issues that I brought up about cost and timing and efficiency and probability of success that are able to address those issues. Those are the guys that are going to succeed. Those are the guys that I'm going to look for, um, you know, to, to recommend in, in my, in my portfolio. Well, going off that, you know, we mentioned some of the trends that were happening in 2019 that you found interesting, you know, what are you seeing in 2020 in terms of, Mm. you know, new technological innovation that's going to be coming forth in biotech? Well, one, one area, and I don't cover it, I'll admit this, but I think AI is just, uh, you know, a great thing, artificial intelligence, you know, I, I think it's a great thing that's come along that really can enhance a lot of things in the healthcare space. I, the, the thing I think it might help the most is actually diagnosis. That's not my area, but doctors, when they're diagnosing something, they have so many variables and factors they need to look at. I mean, it's just too much for any mind to really comprehend. Mm-hmm. If they have an assistant, an AI assistant, to help them narrow down, I think diagnosis will really improve. That'll help people get treatment earlier um, than, than they otherwise might. It'll improve the health of all Americans and you know everyone around the world. So I think that's a really big benefit that we can see from AI. Uh, in my area, AI can help, I think, with that issue we talked about earlier where it takes too long and the success rates are too low in drug development. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can get AI in there and, and, and set it up properly, we can avoid making a lot of the errors that, uh, that are out there, mm-hmm. right? So we can get a higher probability of success. If we can take a drug, uh, and I'll, I'll remind you of a statistic that we use in our research. When we see a drug in phase one, generally about only one in 10 of those makes it through all the way to approval, right? So if we can use AI to get rid of maybe three of those 10 that are not going to make it, then we have a one in seven chance. You know, I'm just throwing out numbers, but mm-hmm. I mean, I think if we use it effectively, we can really dramatically enhance the probability of success and focus on those things that'll work. And then also we can use AI to quickly abandon projects that aren't gonna work. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been so many drugs in the Alzheimer's space, for example, where if you had probably done some uh, done some initial research and, and took an initial look at them, you would have seen they weren't going to go anywhere and you could have saved a lot of money to allocate elsewhere. So I think this will really help in that issue. I, I just, you know, what's interesting on that point with AI, it's just you, like, where are they, where would they get the data sets to then sure. put, put it, put into that algorithm that they, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, I, it right. just seems well, you so need difficult records. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well I mean, it's, it's, I, I think, I think getting the data is actually not the hardest part. I think the hardest part is putting the data together in a way, in the proper way, mm-hmm. right? So that when you get the data input, you know how to interpret the, the you know, the AI knows how to interpret it correctly. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. Cause you know, when we have an individual in any clinical trial, we can take a blood test and run a panel of, you know, 50 or 60 different, different attributes. And, right. you know, we can store that data and have it in a matrix where we can use it whenever we need it. But, you know, putting that together and, uh, and finding, you know, where, you know, certain higher levels of certain biomarkers and lower levels of certain biomarkers are, a lo- are um, associated with, you know, certain types of uh, people who benefit greater from uh, a certain therapy or not. I mean, that's, that's going to be the hard part to do. Um, I mean, I mean, but yeah, it takes people smarter than me. Uh, Me too. To figure that out. So <laughs> hopefully they'll they'll be successful and, and make everyone healthier. Listen, I I was just trying to compete, you know, and, and trying to sound smart. You know, I, I'm I'm not claiming to. <laughs> it's, de- <laughs> it's definitely outside of our both of our well, my pay grade for sure. Um, so okay, so my my next question then is, you know, okay, we covered 2019. Looked at some of the trends. Looked at the trends going into 2020. How this election and the whole political process might affect healthcare and biotech. You know, my, my favorite question to ask, and, and this one now is to you, is what, what would you say is an investing experience that 
helped shape how you now look at biotech as a whole? Mm. Okay. Um, an investing experience that helped me shape how I look at biotech. I mean, I think one of the guiding principles that is important for any investment is to have a, a portfolio of assets, right? Sure. You know, I, I mean, I think there's so many companies that have a story and data that are really supportive of success. And then you find out that, you know, it doesn't work. And I mean, you know, that's part of the game. And I, I make that very clear in my research. I think most biotech under, uh, analysts understand that. And, and, and the payoff is you, you find that one in 10 where, you know, it's really a great, it's a blockbuster, right? Right. You know, that's what you want. So I think the thing that I have learned is that don't put all your eggs into one basket, right? You, you, should, you should make educated guesses based on, you know, numbers that are out, you know, your own analysis and, and, and due diligence based on the numbers. And if you have a portfolio of names like that, you should come out ahead. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's based on the data. <laughs> you know, they say that they say that in the healthcare space and the, in the, in the life sciences space, you know, it, it all depends on the data. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same thing is applicable to investment, uh, you know, the investment approach as well. If you know what, how likely it is for your, something to succeed and it's trading below that, then, uh, you know, it's, it's probably a good bet. So going off that, I mean, let's say for, let's say we have a retail micro cap investor, let's say they don't have, you know, a ton of capital to throw around at, let's say even mm. five, five to 10 names, you know, mm -hmm. what, what would your be, what would your advice be to them that maybe are like, okay, I'm very interested in oncology or neurodegenerative mm. diseases, but you know, I don't have all the crazy amounts of excess capital to throw into five names that are going after the same thing. Sure. Uh, there are ETFs out there. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I mean, that's one way to do it. There's, there's funds that focus on that. Uh, I, I don't have a list of those, but I know there are a few of them. I, I, I want to look at them before I, I mention them uh, on, on the podcast just to make sure that they represent what I thought they did. But that's, that's, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. You know, you can get a, a diversified portfolio and a number of names. Um, but you know, you don't necessarily have to diversify in biotech itself. I mean, you may find a great name and consumer name, you may find a great retail name and you know, you may find a great biotech name, you know, just don't put more money in there than, uh, you know, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, diversified portfolio is not only diversified within a sector, but also among sectors mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So it might then, uh, to kind of round out the interview here, th this question I ask every single guest, and I'm going to alter it a little bit for our purposes today, you know, and cause you already gave a little bit of advice for new micro cap investors and, you know, maybe some, that uh, some things they can look for if they're interested in healthcare and, and biotech, you know, but we're in a, we're in a, an arena right now where there's so much information out there on mm. biotech that sure. you can comb through and read. It can sometimes be overwhelming. So what are some tips and tricks that you can give new microcap investors that are like, okay, I want to know more about neurodegenerative diseases because it affected my family back in the day. And, you know, I sure. want to invest in a company that is helping, you know, what can they do to maybe sift through or quickly sift through <laughs> As best as possible. <laughs> maybe maybe somebody <laughs> could give me that advice too. Um, I mean, I, you know, what I do, I'll just say what I do is I, you know, you I try do? to re read go. a little bit on each one of them uh, okay. when the data comes out. You know, I, I read through it and I, and I look at the commentary. But I think you, you, you have to rely on experts a lot, you know, unless you're devoting all of your time to it because it is, you know, it is a full-time gig paying attention even to one therapeutic area like – Alzheimer's disease. I mean, it's a full-time job paying attention to everything that goes on there. On there, uh, I've sent, I found some really great resources on um, on the internet that that actually go into you know the drugs out there and kind of where they stand. Uh, there's a really great one for Alzheimer's. I, I can't remember the website. Maybe I'll give it to you later. You can put it put it up there. Mm -hmm. But it goes into each one of the drugs, you know, and where 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 it is, uh, what it does, how it how it functions, its mechanism of action. And really educates you in terms of uh, you know what what the status is. And in, in order to find companies, um, if you're not willing to go th you know sift through and comb through each one of the small ones, buy buy a big biotech that's focused on oncology. They'll they'll do the work for you and they'll they'll buy they'll buy the company. Um, but you know our, Zach's SCR, we have research which goes into exquisite detail uh, for our companies and really tries to help educate the investor to get them up to speed for the specific indication uh where you know our companies are working so that might be one way uh to do it 
but uh, you know, it's 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 a tough job. It takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. But you know, if if you, if anyone has a certain disease of specific interest because you know it, it's 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 in their family, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I advise them to look for some of these sites where they uh, consolidate all this information and and you know look for the companies that are working on this and and you know see if they're progressing their drugs through the um, clinical trial process and making uh, you know and making um, positive waves. So. That's, you know, it just takes a lot of time and work. But, uh, I mean, I think, you know, all the research that's being done, it's really great for, uh, you know, the outcome's going to be really great for everybody. All right. With that, John, where can my audience go and find more information about you and Zach's SCR? Uh, so, uh, scr.zax.com, scr.zax.com is where uh, our research can be found. And if you look under our analyst names, of which we have 10, uh, about half of us are in the, the healthcare space and the other half in other areas. Uh, you can find our individual research. And my name, as you said, is John Vandermost. And so if you look under my name, you'll see uh, the names that I, I cover. Mm-hmm. So what about on Twitter? You, you got social media handles too. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, and actually that's the best way to do it, I think, because I, I post all of uh, – all of all of my research on there when it comes out, it's at Van John Ten. Uh, so that's on Twitter at Van John Ten V A N J O H N one zero. And uh, I'd also try to post interesting articles there as well. And and I think when this video comes out, I'll, I'll put a, a copy of that on uh, on the Twitter oh, too. Oh, you will for me. I, oh, that I is so Just sweet. For you. <laughs> Usually I don't, but I, I figured I would for you. Oh, you know, you, I, I really, that, that's my, that, is that my Christmas gift? My Hanukkah gift? I, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it, it will be. It will be. It will be. <laughs> well, John, thanks again for joining me today. This was a lot of fun and uh, I'm excited to do the next update with you. Sounds good, Robbie. Thank you so much. All right.